So this is a brief overview and it may go a little quickly, but I will be happy to take your comments and questions, if not during this session, certainly by email. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. I'm going to set the stage first here uh, and then talk to you about the new RDA toolkit. The beta site became official RDA on December 15th of last year. And this was a result of a four year project called the RDA 3R project or the RDA restructure and redesign project. The main impetus for this project and the timing was because RDA needed to align with the new IFLA library reference model. We had been previously based on the suite of IFLA Ferber, FRAD, and FRSAD functional requirements models, and because those changed, RDA needed to change. But it also gave us an opportunity to, to do some additional things. For example, we offered more flexibility in choosing how to record an element. We took a new approach to relationship designators. We revised RDA to better align with linked data applications. We made changes to promote greater international adoption, which is a significant goal for RDA's future. We improved the toolkit interface and we achieved the desired WCAG or web content accessibility guidelines accessibility rating of two, double A in 2.0. So sorry, that's, that's that little thing is a little off there. We've got the double A rating, which is the middle. We restructured underlying data support imp to improve editorial work processes, including the creation of translations. Now, in spite of all of that, the original toolkit remains available for some time to come. Ultimately, we will be st starting a one year countdown clock, but you will have plenty of notice for that. And there's no chance that that countdown clock is going to start in 2021. Next slide, please. So official RDA is what I'm going to be referring to as the new toolkit from this point forward. The implementation is will be determined by various cataloging communities as they are ready. And we've already heard that PCC will not be considering this until the middle of next year. But RDA is designed for an unpredictable and evolving publishing environment and changing user expectations that were not necessarily in place even with original RDA and certainly not with its predecessor, AACR2. There's an expectation that we should be able to connect our users to resources anytime and anywhere. RDA is also positioned to expand for use in archives and museums, although that would require the addition of more elements that are specific to those communities working in concert with them. That initiative will probably not take place for another couple of years. RDA can also be used in any RDF linked data application. And part of the interest in having that happen is to be able to accommodate the ingest of large metadata description sets from external sources and still parse them as RDA compatible. This was very important to some national libraries during this phase of RDA development, and it's something that we could have achieved. Significantly, RDA uses an open world assumption. Our metadata statements or think of them as MARC records or individual MARC fields can be used or reused anywhere. Next slide, please. So I mentioned IFLA LRM. It's a consolidation and update of RDA's original underlying functional requirements models. As those models, it is a high level conceptual reference model and uses an entity relationship modeling framework. Its scope is library data relating to the universe of discourse. Administrative data like who's got this book checked out at the moment is out of scope. LRM makes no assumptions about how data might be stored in a given system, so it should be applicable across the board, and RDA really tried to adapt that as well. LRM is driven by the user tasks of find, identify, select, obtain, and explore. It's aligned with the broader CDOC conceptual reference model, or CDOC is the International Council of Museums Committee on Documentation. And so it, it should align well with that model and the data created from that model by GLAM institutions. An official RDA is an implementation of LRM with some expansions that retain the basic structure of the elements and the relationships among them. And the LRM allows for expansions. Next slide, please. 
So what changes happened in RDA due to LRM? Well, we added new entities that were in LRM that were not in previous models. But instead of implementing LRM's res, which is its top level, we implemented RDA entity instead. It's a little more refined and it only covers all of the other RDA entities. Res is broader as in everything in the universe of human discourse. And since RDA really does not address subjects outside of RDA entities, this is why res was created. A significant change is that there are no fictional values for entities in, in the new LRM. This is a change from what was in original RDA and what was in FRAD, so we can't have fictional persons as creators. But we can't record fictional places and time spans as instances of those things either. These are all valid concepts, but they're not occurrences of these entities and need to be captured and labeled in another way. RDA also now has an increase in relationship elements and fewer attribute elements, and I'll explain that a little bit later, and introduce new attributes or class groups of attributes, if you will, um, both representative expression elements and manifestation statement elements, which I have slides about later. Next plus slide, please. So I'm going to give you a really fast orientation to the new toolkit. Next slide. First of all, there are no more core elements. These instead have been replaced by information in guidance chapters about coherent descriptions of information resources, minimum descriptions of a resource entity, and effective description of an in information resource. These taken together, along with guidance from your community, will let you understand what you must do to appropriately describe a resource. So these things include relating the descriptions of work expression, manifestation, and item as appropriate, recording the value for at least one appellation element of the entity. Think of appellation elements as names or titles, the, how, how you call something. And then adding other entities and elements that are useful for identification or access. So, an RDA compliant record could be extremely brief, but it could also be really quite comprehensive. And we wanted to leave that flexibility up to the cataloging agencies and catalogers using RDA. So as I said, there are a lot of options, very little guidance about requirements. What are you going to do with this? Well, we expect people to be using application profiles that specify which entities and elements are required or optional or repeatable. And we expect those to be created by cataloging communities, not individual institutions or catalogers, although they could sort of be nested. I know that when RDA was first implemented, my institution took a look at RDA, the LCPC CPSs, and then tried to decide if there was anything beyond that that we would require. This would be the same kind of process. Next slide, please. So I'm going to take a look at sections of the toolkit. I don't know if you are having the problem I'm having with black lines covering the titles of my slides. If you are, trust me, this says entities. And what is going across the top here, the entities, guidance, policies, resources, etc., that is a screenshot of the navigation tab at the top of the RDA toolkit. So we'll go through several of these, but not all of them due to lack of time. Entities is the first thing I want to talk about. The RDA definition is that this is an abstract class of key conceptual objects in the universe of human discourse that is a focus of interest to users of RDA metadata in a system for resource discovery. Or rephrased, an entity is some aspect of the real world, physically or logically, that can be distinguished from other aspects. Entities in RDA are limited to the things libraries want to collect, describe, and provide access to. There are 13 of these in RDA. As I mentioned, RDA entity is at the top. And LRM allows us to provide refinements of elements. And so we retained corporate body and family largely unchanged from original RDA as refinements of collective agent. Entities have the ability to search or browse by attribute or relationship elements at the bottom of each entity page, which I'll show you on the next slide, please. So here are at the bottom of the person page, you get this display 
with elements and radio buttons where you can say all attribute elements or relationship elements. So in that left hand side, I've limited it to attribute elements for person and that returns a simple list of 10. If I pick relationship elements, once I pick that button, then I have a drop down that lets me be specific or just show all of them. So I decided here to show relationships between person and person. So this has also 10 results. And all of those blue link things with a little page with the arrow, those are all click hot links that will click you through to the element page for that. Next slide, please. So trust me, this slide title says elements. The RDA definition is a specific aspect, characteristic, attribute, or relationship used to describe an RDA entity. All RDA elements are unique and can only describe one entity. Now you notice elements is not in this navigation dropdown. Why? Because there are over 3,000 of them. There is no way we could get any kind of meaningful dropdown that way. Why are there so many? Well. As we worked through the 3R project, we realized we needed to explicitly declare them for each type of agent as applicable. So authors can be agents, collective agents, corporate bodies, families, or persons. So we had to create five elements for author. There are also some hierarchical relationships. For some implementations of RDA, author person will be sufficient, but for other implementations, individual libraries or groups of people may decide that they want to be more specific, such as librettist person, lyricist person, repertoire person, and screenwriter person. So if, if the relationship elements here are too big and too broad, you can take the higher up ones and use fewer. Next slide, please. So there are two ways to find an element. My example here is looking for the title of series element. I can approach this via entity, the entity's drop down menu and select manifestation, go to the bottom of that page and simply start typing title of, and then that returns the four results that use that phrase. And those are clickable, so I can get there that way. Or if I know that it is an element name and I want to search it exactly and directly, I can do an exact title search of title of series and it takes me directly to that page. Next slide, please. So, so as I mentioned earlier, there are two kinds of elements, relationship elements and attribute elements. A relationship element is one, not surprisingly, that relates to RDA entities. This is 75% of all of those RDA elements. These end up being a transformation of what we think of as relationship designators in the original toolkit. Those were those terms in appendices I, J, K, and M. Now in RDA, they're full-blown elements. And they can turn be, occur between any entities. They're not limited to say work to work, person to person, but it can be things like work to manifestation, person to time span, place to corporate body. They always have inverses with predictable naming conventions. So source consulted and source consulted of, title of work and title of work of. Is this pretty English? Not really. Is it understandable? Hopefully with a little training. Attribute elements, on the other hand, are elements that have inherent or externally imputed characteristics of an RDA entity, things like carrier type, language of person, number of conference. Now, in theory, these could be made relationships, but for number of conference, for example, I can't imagine why you'd want to be able to pull together every conference that has had a fifth occurrence. So these are really more appropriate as attributes. However, many original RDA attributes became relationships elements, as I alluded to earlier. For example, date of birth, birth is a relationship between person and time span. Place of conference is a relationship between place and corporate body. ISSN is a, a name, so it's relating a work to a nomen. And given name is also relating to a nomen, in this case, a person to a nomen. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at an element page layout. These are selected screenshots from title proper. So this starts with a unique label, title proper, that's the element name, and it's followed by a unique definition. And that may have additional paragraphs. It may say additional things about what it does include or what it does not include. 
Then probably in your display is a little blue box that's it just says element reference on it is the top of this little blue tab. Uh, you can set that to open automatically, or if you want to view it, you can click on the eyeball. So my screenshots show the open vision here of the element reference. It starts with the IRI, which is unique, and links to the RDA registry. All elements will have a domain, and if they're relationships, they will have the range, the other category of entity that this element relates to. They will always have at least one alternate label, which is a verbalized label. This really helps in relationships if you're trying to understand which direction they're going. And they'll have original RDA labels if applicable or other related labels from the toolkit. So earlier title proper and later title proper are not separate elements anymore. They are title proper associated with a given time span. That's why they're alternates here. Next slide, please. So continuing that element reference, it didn't quite all fit on the first page, is mappings to other standards. And right now we map to IFLA LRM, Dublin Core, and MARC 21. Uh, the default display here is to have the plus sign. So you, to see what it is, you click on that and you get the minus as I did for Dublin Core and MARC 21 here. Following that is pre-recording. Pre-recording is essentially information that tells you if this is really the element you want to be using. So I think of it sort of background information before you get going. Then a recording session, which is general information regardless of what recording method you use. And then finally, specific recording methods follow that. Sometimes elements will not have pre-recording or they may not have much, if anything, under recording. It depends on the nature of the element. Next play page, please. Finally, at the bottom of the page, uh, if there are full examples, there they'll be labeled as a view in context example. To see it, you click on the little blue box with the eyeball and it will open up and will show you not just this element, in this case title proper, but that title proper in context of who the author was, who the publisher was, et cetera. And then at the bottom, you will have a list of related elements if, they are, if there are any, so broader and narrower elements. And also you will always have the inverse uh, for relationships. And at the very bottom of the page, in case you ever want to know, it's the last date the page was updated and the page URL. Next slide, please. So a little closer look at element reference, this time with a different element, place of capture. How do you read this information? Well, if you follow the sequence of numbers here, then you might end up putting together a little convoluted sentence that would go, the element place of capture relates a domain and an expression to a range, a place, which is back to the definition, a place that is associated with recording, filming, et cetera, the content of an expression. So a convoluted sentence, but you can put things in order and maybe make it make a little more sense than just these things by themselves. Next slide, please. So the element labels. They are designed to be unique, predictable, and capable of machine derivation. This supports implementation scenarios, which require labels to identify the nature of the relationship to be exact. They are not intended for end user display. Some of them aren't too bad. Some of them, if you've looked very closely, you probably detest. Uh, this is not because they were designed for display. It's because they were designed uh, to be unique with over 3,000 elements. So what we recommend for the end user display is that a community come together and decide what they want to display and make a programmatic mapping between that the RDA element label and as something that is more user friendly. We don't want to dictate that on an international level. Next slide, please. Another aspect of element pages that I didn't show you in the previous screenshot is the condition and option boxes. This is the new toolkits approach to alternatives, exceptions, optional emissions, and optional additions that we had in original RDA. The option boxes might exist alone, or they can be in a sequence, and policy statements can then guide you which ones to apply. Condition boxes, however, are always paired with at least one option box. And in both of these option box, case, box cases, they may or may not be exclusive, but they, you know, they certainly could be. And policy statements can provide guidance about which ones you should or should not use. Next slide, please. 
So here's an example of option, option boxes under content type. Uh, because I don't know why you would actually record content type without a controlled list of terms, the, it's not surprising that if you look at this in the toolkit with the draft LCPCC policy statements, you'll see not to apply either option. But you can see there are two options here without any conditions. You can either record an uncontrolled term that's transcribed from a source, or you can record details or other unstructured information. Next slide, please. Condition option boxes, on the other hand, tell you what you have and then the options that you have to deal with it. So for media type, your condition is a manifestation consists of two or more media types. And there are three option boxes. I think in this case, these are mutually exclusive. You can record all of them, you can record the predominant one, or you can record the ones that you think are the most predominant. Next slide, please. This is actually the equivalent instruction in original RDA. And so you see that line with telling you that there's an alternative. What's interesting in looking at this is it really only looks like there are two options. You either record the predominant part or the most substantial parts. Uh, the recording all of them is not as explicit here. You have to sort of understand the RDA code or, or the phrasing that lets you interpret that first sentence as meaning you can record all of them. So actually, I think the new toolkit in this particular case is clearer. Next slide, please. So here's a quick look at the guidance chapters. We have a lot of them. That's why there's a split over here on the left. Um, the chapters explain many concepts. Some of those concepts are not as new or as they might seem. There, there are some familiar instruction kind of things embedded in some of this. Some of these have subsections as well. So if you mouse over them, such as transcription guidelines, you can see that there are guidelines on basic transcription and guidelines on normalized transcription. This is something that is got a guidance chapter, but once you start looking at it, you realize that you already knew most of the stuff with transcription. Basic transcription is take what you see. Guidelines on normalized transcription is essentially what we've been doing in Anglo-American practice since I've been a cataloger in the mid 80s. Guidelines are also frequently referred to from specific instructions that allows us to make a reference instead of repeating the text over and over and over in all of those element pages. So it, you will frequently see this um, under identifier for general guidance on identifiers, see guidance, recording methods, recording and identifier. When you're first using RDA, that link will be helpful, but after you're really familiar with it, if this is something you use regularly, you're not going to look, need to look that up. So it's another good reason to use the guidance. Next slide, please. All right, here comes the real whirlwind tour. Next slide. Vocabulary encoding schemes is something that's at least a new phrase in RDA. The RDA definition is that it's a named structured list of representations of controlled values for elements. So you can think of this essentially as a controlled vocabulary. Now there are VESs specific to RDA, such as the RDA list of terms for content type. Uh, there are ISO code lists. This is also a controlled list. And so it's a VES. Um, standard terminology from sources outside RDA, the music community has a specific list of terms for medium of performance, LCMPT, that would also be a vocabulary encoding scheme. And authority control systems themselves, once you've recorded an authorized access point, that is a, not just a string, but once you've validated it, it's a vocabulary encoding scheme. Same with other thesauri. These do not include simple keyword indexes, however. Next slide, please. All right, I mentioned manifestation statements earlier. This is the only slide you get about it. An RDA definition is this is a statement that appears in a manifestation and, and deemed to be significant for users to understand how the manifestation represents itself. So transcribing title page, that would be a manifestation statement. It's designed both for machine transcription and for simplified decision making because less parsing is required. I know this is of particular interest to the rare book community in the US for those imprint statements that are very hard to decide what's a printer, what's a publisher, etc. A manifestation can be a very, very broad 
thing. It's, it can just be by itself, but there are also 13 sub elements, including manifestation publication statement and manifestation title and responsibility statement. Notice that in both of those cases, things that were used to parsing separately in MARC are lumped together. These are not required. They, um, it's perfectly fine for people doing original cataloging to do the separate elements like title proper and statement of responsibility relating to title proper. But mixing and matching is allowed. So it'll be up to, again, policy statements to, as to whether you use these or not. Next slide, please. All right, really quickly about data provenance, another really important thing. Uh, this provides information about the metadata recorded in an element or set of elements, which can be used to infer the context and quality of the metadata. So it's like knowing that the quote came from a reputable reference source or that this record that I'm working from came from the Library of Congress or is PCC authenticated, that kind of provenance we're talking about. The metadata being described by data provenance are treated as a metadata work. That metadata work consists either of a metadata statement, like I said earlier, think of a, a MARC field, or metadata description set, which think of in shorthand as a MARC record. Next slide, please. So why do we need to use this? Well, there are bunch of different applications. We can identify the content standard we used, RDA, LCSH, the language or script of the description, the transcription standard we're using. Is it basic? Is it normalized? Is it something we came up with ourselves? We can also capture who recorded the metadata or who published the metadata. And also the source of metadata, which includes the source of title information or a source consulted. And it can even include the date the metadata was created. There's a lot of different uses. Right now, this is spottily implemented in MARC, but the MARC RDA working group is looking to see if they can implement that further. Next slide, please. All right, here's a whirlwind tour of aggregates. There are important definitions here. An aggregating work is a plan to select and arrange one or more expressions of one or more works and embody them in an aggregate manifestation. So the, the emphasis here, a plan. The aggregating expression is the realization of that plan. And then an aggregate manifestation, or just simply aggregate, is a manifestation that embodies all of this. And the expressions that are aggregated may realize one or more works. That manifestation may be issued in one or more units. And there are three kinds of aggregates, a collection aggregate where sort of everything is on an even relationship to each other. There's a set of three books that are published together. An augmentation aggregate, which is um, illustrations, introduction, index, and a main text. And parallel aggregates, uh, government documents say published in, in Canada must be in English and French. So those would be parallels. Next slide, please. So the characteristics of aggregates, as I emphasized earlier, the works and expressions are plans and not the content. The creator of such things is the person who came up with the plan, not the person who had the content. Importantly, this is not a whole part relationship. The relationship between the expressions that are in the aggregate, they're not an inherent feature of the works they realize. They do not always have to be issued that way together to be you know, that's not the whole part thing. So the same expression of a novel might be published with and without an introduction, but it would be, still be the same novel. An audio track can appear on different CD compilations and it's not a new work because it's with different other works. However, there is a work expression lock for the aggregating part of this. If an aggregating expression realizes one and only one aggregating work, then if something changes, you have a new aggregate. So if two identical, if two aggregate manifestations have similar but not identical content, you have two different aggregating works or expressions. Next slide. This is a, a LRM model for aggregates taken straight from the library reference model. What's important here is that everything focuses in on that aggregate manifestation. The individual works and expressions are linked to it. They're on the left. 
the aggregating work and aggregating expression are over there on the right, they have a place to play in that too. What's important here is that because of the choices that I'll get to in a minute, you don't have to describe each one of these things. You can, but you don't have to. And that's part of the shortcut expression, the, the dotted line things showing you there that sometimes you don't have to describe everything in this model. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there are plenty of choices. And what you do is going to depend on the resource you're cataloging, your collection, and your understanding of user needs. So you could record all of the works and expressions embodied in the manifestation. A monograph that contains two mysteries by different authors. I don't know why you would not describe them both and give them separate access points so everybody can know what's in your collection. A play with a scholarly preface. You might want to describe the play in detail and make a note about the preface because it's so significant. And that would be what you would normally do with these collection aggregates or the play with a scholarly preface is also it's an augmentation aggregate, but with a part that you think is important. You could record some of the works expression and expressions embodied in the manifestation, but not all of them. Some of them may not be important enough to even mention. So my book has an index. Am I going to describe that index? I might put it in a note, but that would be it. That's okay too. Or you can simply relate the aggreg aggregate manifestation. Can you go back, please, um, to the work and aggregating work and expression? Why you would want to do even a contents notes for 600 verses of classical Korean poetry translated into English, or even how helpful would the titles be of 24 Chinese folk tales and fairy tales? So you could just relate the manifestation to the work expression and ignore these separate works. They, intellectually, they're there, but you don't have to record them. All right, now you can go ahead. Thank you. So there's some specific aggregate elements. Aggregates, that's an expression that is chosen as part of the plan of an aggregating expression, manifestation of expression, collective title, because you can't have a collective title of something if you don't have more than one thing, contributor agent to aggregate, contributor agent of music, contributor agent of still image, and contributor agent of text. Again, you won't have contributors unless you're contributing to something else. Next slide, please. So diachronic works. These are those works that are planned to be embodied over time rather than as a single act of publication. By their very nature, the content will change over time. We can't predict the future, but our cataloging may give some clues about what we thought or what the publisher thought at the time we received the first volume, if you will. Um, these may or may not prove true. I know I certainly have cataloged multi-volume sets based on the publisher's statement that this will be complete in 10 volumes and will be finished by, you know, in five years from now. And then about seven years from now, they decide that there's an 11th volume. Or we have serials that say, hey, this is going to come out quarterly, but we all know that kind of thing changes as well. But as I illustrated, this is more than just serials. It includes multi-part monographs issued over time. Next slide, please. So the characteristics of diachronic works, as you might have figured out, they have to have an extension plan. And there are three components of that. The requirement is it the addition of content required to sustain the integrity of the work. Let's say I have a dictionary that I'm issuing over time. Yes, uh, it's not going to be in and in, in a work with integrity until that volume that contains Z is published. The extension mode, you really have two different options. Will the content be extended through accumulation and succession as that serially issued dictionary or a replacement and integration uh, such as the RDA toolkit? Extension termination, as we all know, there are things that have a planned end of life and those that don't. So that, that's a characteristic of a diachronic work. It's one or the other. Next slide, please. All right, what's really important with diachronic works is there's not just the work expression lock as there are with aggregates, but it's actually a work expression and manifestation lock, sometimes known as the WEM lock. The diachronic work is realized by only one expression and embodied by only one manifestation. If the work plan changes, you have a new work. 
The boundaries of what that means can be set by institutions, but these are the, gui the broad guidelines in RDA. So the changes could include differences in scope or editorial policy, genre or literary form, target audience, and style. And just why this is this way is because the online and print versions of a serial might be identical right until this date, but they could easily diverge in the future. They this the web could, version could start having hot links or more illustrations or color illustrations or additional articles. And so because of this ongoing nature of these works and the possibility of divergence, they're separate works from the outset. This is a change from the modeling done originally in Ferber. That's great, fine, but our users want to know that these things are related. So how do we bring these together in our catalogs? RDA has introduced a work group concept. This is a group of two or more works that have a common appellation assigned from a vocabulary encoding scheme, or what you might think, authorized access point. Uh, it's not an element itself, but some work group elements exist, including, as I mentioned, the authorized access point for work group. You could assign these to each one of them and then use that access point to bring them together in the catalog. Next slide, please. There are sp some diachronic elements that are specific to this category, like editorial director agent. Uh, this is somebody who has editorial policy responsibilities, but not the overall content of a diachronic work, the founder agent of a work, if you can initiate a work, but you might, that might be all you do. Integrating works and successive works obviously are also diachronic elements. Next slide, please. So quickly on to representative expressions. What are these? Well, they provide the values of specific elements used to identify a work and distinguish it from other works. Any expression can be used as a representative expression with the relevant element values coming from that expression. But there may also be more than one expression that can be treated as a representative expression with different values coming from different expressions. Why do you even care about this? Well, it's about representing the uh, intention of the creator. Next slide, please. So these are characteristics that in the LRM model live at the expression level, but are useful because they could be associated with the work as a whole, because they do best represent the intention of the creator. 17 such elements have been added to RDA, including language and script of exp representative expression, date, extent, color content, and content type. And these are all related to the equivalent that is not of representative expression. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Um, Katsushika is the great way of uh, Kanagawa, has a content type of representative expression, still image, has date of representative expression, and just work with me here. I picked the best I could, 1826. I know that there's actually a range and questionable. Has color content of representative expression color, that would be choosing that as opposed to polychrome, and has language of representative expression if you wanted to do it, uh, Japanese. Uh, why worry about this? Well, I know that Kanagawa's work here has been reproduced a lot, and maybe there's something here, especially say the um, still image or the data representative expression might be really useful to associate with all of the images, even if you have a 2020 poster version. Next slide, please. So representative expressions have um, a use extended to aggregates, the aggregating expression is not a representative expression. It doesn't contain the content of the expressions that are aggregated, but they can be derived from that. And I see I'm running out of time, um, but let me explain quickly. It's the same 17 elements. They are grouped differently by what they apply to, but it's still the same. So the outcome for our users is still the same. Next slide, please. Quickly on to community resources. Next slide. This is a new section of the toolkit. It was first made available in the September 2020 release, and it's under that resources drop down that I didn't show you earlier. This is under active development by the RSC, and the structure and content therefore may change as development continues. At this point, we've relocated community specific instructions from what you might think of as base RDA. 
it was important to have a place to relocate them because they are still available in the toolkit and some people still use these. If you go there right now, you will find reworking of the original toolkits, appendices for capitalization, abbreviations, initial articles, and titles of nobility. And in the future, this will also include details about stringing coding schemes. That's the next slide. The control of content and development of this section will be up to user communities and not to the RSC. All right, next slide, string encoding schemes. What on earth are these? Well, it's a set of string values and associated set of rules that describe a mapping between that set of strings and the value of an element. In other words, they tell catalogers how to build a string, the components, the order of the data, and the punctuation. If you have ever created an authorized access point and did not create a corresponding authority record, but you followed all the instructions in AAC or 2 or RDA to create that access point, you've applied a string encoding scheme. And the reason that this is needs to be local rather than global RDA is because there are a lot of different approaches to the same data. Yao Ming with a comma in 1980 dash is the form of his name in the LC authority file with the parentheses, parentheses used instead is what the National Library of Poland uses. And of course, in a Chinese catalog, you almost certainly wouldn't be using his name in English. Next slide, please. So for more information about all of this, I encourage you to take a look at the RDA Steering Committee's website, which includes pages for presentation by year and documents by year. Uh, certainly the most recent presentation should be the most current. The problem with canned presentations is they always uh, reflect a particular point in time. Of course, there's official RDA. The RDA Toolkit website has lots of updates from the publisher. And I also encourage you, the RDA YouTube channel is a really good place to get more information. It includes a link to the January 2021 RDA toolkit demo, which I think took about an hour, and the RDA concept series short videos. All of the information listed here is free. OK, uh, next slide, please. That, uh... I also want to thank Jesselyn Zoom and uh, of LC and the Hideyuki Marmoto of Columbia University for helping put these updates together. And for this updates that we will update uh, PCC uh, documentation updated on PCC website, uh, the first three uh, link page and also OCLC mark authority updates from uh, OCLC Workout validation release notes. Uh, last but not least, the PCC Wikidata uh, pilot, a very brief uh, touch on that one. Next page, please. So the, uh, the, first, the first page that we are looking at is the NACO advisor group update since May 2020. Uh, that's from our last cataloging workshop. And this is the group that they, um, monitor PCC list discussion and provide uh, further uh, guidance as needed. Uh, one uh, guidance came up is the uh, constructing AAP for canceled and online conference that list. And the other one is talking about PCC CCT feasibility study. Next slide, please. As you know, many conference has been canceled or switched online or in hybrid format, uh, continue on site uh, with access online. So uh, the guidance is focusing on recording location for con uh, conference uh, applying RDA uh, 11322. So for cancel conference that you do now recording location for online conference, you recording online as a location. For hybrid conference, the recommendation is to uh, not recording online, but limit to location of the physical location. And I'll include all the links to the document uh, so you can uh, read the instruction uh, yourself. <clears throat> Next page, please. Um, CCT. Uh, Next page, yeah, on CCT feasibility study. This is about one type of the resource that uh, incomplete collection of literary forms by one agent. This is something like so-and-so, poems, selection. Uh, this is uh, 
compilation of uh, poems or short story I say correspondence you know they have their own title that instead applying 62223 that we are asking to apply RDA 6224 for the feasibility study and then to re record that uh, the study that you did uh, on the survey form on the page. And this was started last August and did December last year. Next slide, please. And I showed the example that uh, if you apply 6 Two two ten three. You will add a CCT form uh, two forty there and classify as a collection using A six and applying six two two four. That you will catalog it as uh, the title itself as a uh, title purpose and then classify by a separate title. Next slide, please. And for this study, they will uh, looking at the policy change on the legacy data of those CCT and also treatment of translation and impact on uh, bibliographic maintenance, exactly. And uh, USSD as a local practice, we have been applied uh, 6224. So I'm very excited to see this study and hopefully come out uh, positive to uh, hopefully to making change. Uh, we're looking forward to the result to be announced by PCC group. Next slide, please. And the next documentation that we are looking is the NACO documentation updates web page and to looking at any new updates. And also you can look at the NACO landing page that put the most recent uh, update document uh, on that page. The first one is the NACO 024 best practice. Uh, we're going to talk about a DCM Z1 session. And the other one is undifferentiated CCT work and expression authority record. Uh, the next one is a NACO participant manual, uh, first edition that revise update for RDA that released July 2020. And catalogers are free to apply the guidance uh, for best practice uh, listed in this manual. Next page, please. And for uh, undifferentiated uh, CCD work expression, also record, this is the record that representing a group of a different compilation that by the same author under same uh, AAP. And the example taken here was from uh, CJK NACO training 2017. You see that uh, we have uh, six different compilation that under one uh, authority record. And now PCC encouraged NACO catalogger to start create a differentiated work expression AAP uh, when encounter this uh, undifferentiated to split it, kind of like we do for uh, undifferentiated personal name. <laughs> and next slide, please. And in this example, you would create uh, six different uh, AAP for uh, six different compilation. And the FAQ document provide a guidance on how to create AAP and one and how to either qualify and one to how to record uh, a tribute relationship. It's very comprehensive and include a lot example, uh, very self uh, explanatory, uh, easy to follow. And I also uh, provide the link to uh, 2017 CJK training uh, on work expression. It's still relevant. I have a good CJK example if you want to referencing to it. Um, and I, next slide, please. I do want to print out the one um, situation that is sometimes create confusion. Uh, the good strategy here is, uh, oh, this one is uh, about uh, creating AAP for an expression of selection. Uh, you see the cross out example that makes the work uh, level element and the uh, expression level element the, the advice they provide is that you always start with the work level authorized access point and then adding expression level element. So that way you won't confusing when you create AAP. And this example uh, here are the uh, 
expression level element are right now is a language expression. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the instruction also asks you to provide 67 note for undifferentiated record and also for the new record. Uh, due to time limit, I'm not going to get into detail, but when you working on this one, please follow FAQ guidance. Next slide, please. And uh, we move on to DCM Z1 LC guideline supplement updates and cover uh, last August, October, and this February three updates. And the first one is the OOA32 uh, code for undifferentiated name. When that code, uh, for and when record that like coded and differentiated, but actually represent one identity, that at one time that we are able to flip that code from B to A, and now you cannot do that. You, when you found this situation, you are requested to add 67 note uh, and report and differentiate uh, the record to LC for deletion. LC will create a new record and linking the old ICC and number to the new record. Next slide, please. For all to four other standard identifier, and we have been talking about this one, talking about this uh, moratorium, uh, not do anything about the O24. Now the instruction removed, and the new uh, best practice is linked in this instruction. And in this instruction, it says that uh, you do not to add over five, no more than five O24 add to the authority record and you do not routinely delete or changing existing 025. So if you say, I like my five uh, there, I, I won't add it. You cannot do that if there's already have others. And the next slide, please. And there's a lot of detail instruction on what you to do. And I'm not going to race through them. I put it here and uh, I hope you uh, will uh, go in through that, follow that instruction. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here is the list of the uh, PCC uh, core group of PCC sanction vocabulary for each category and uh, use those uh, identifier. Uh, and uh, for 667 notes, you may see that in some authority record, those are part of a pilot project. The uh, guidance suggests you do not delete them when see it. Uh, if you not see it in the record, do not add them. Next slide, please. The new instruction on time period creation, the 388 field was added last August. A catalogers can start using it. Uh, and it's uh, strongly recommend using control vocabulary like LCSH and fast hiding and using suffix two for source and capitalize first term like you do for other data elements I recorded. And for compilation, there's um, two, uh, 388 at the first indicate one indicate that the time period for the work expression contained in the compilation, the time uh, period that creation. And the uh, indicator two is indicate that uh, the compilation, the, the time period of creation origin of a compilation itself. So example here is a collection of Renaissance poetry compiled in the 19th century. Next slide, please. And you can use 388 in conjunction with 046 or instead of 046. And in certain uh, circumstance, uh, it allow you to repeat 388 field, uh, like indicator differ on the uh, example above compilation. And also when vocabulary resource uh, differs, uh, so the example below. But overall general practice is that Repeat the field only when you need for clarity. Next slide, please. The update on 678 uh, biography historical data, uh, it's now, this field is not repeatable. So only one 678 for one authority record. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, 
appendix um, ambiguous entity. Uh, this is a new instruction I did on Canada First Nation entity names. Uh, <coughs> that is added to 2.9 to uh, should be tagged as 151 to align with the instruction for US tribe entities. Next slide, please. So now we move on to uh, OCLC mark authority updates. And uh, this updates, that is a recording change made according to mark 21 authority date updates also made to OCLC mark authority validation rule site. When you see the updates and don't jump right away to implement them, you need to follow PCC instruction. And for example, August 2020 update that include the change made to 883 field on metadata provenance that, uh, however, uh, there's no instruction in DCM Z1, there's LC guideline tell you to not using this field. So you do not want to implement it until later uh, when PCC uh, have further instruction. So for this update, only change that relevant to NACO catalogger are five XX field, subfield I, that it's changed to not repeatable. And uh, uh, 043, now you can repeat 043 in NACO record. And next slide, please. <coughs> the last one, last but not least, is the PCC Wikidata pilot project. I want to point this to you uh, because of time limit, we are not getting into detail. And this is a facilitating NACO light approach uh, to see how we can do a uh, low barrier uh, NACO authority uh, creation. And the project start late uh, October, uh, September last year and plan to run a year. Uh, have a 70 uh, institution to participate and I will uh, assessing compare with other registry to see uh, batch processing, the uh, production QA2s, uh, and also um, a lot of information list on that <clears throat> website. Uh, those are just give you the information and you uh, need to know where those instruction and then to uh, checking them when needed. Thank you. I will take question if we have a time. Um, Shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Erica Chen. Um, uh, I'm from uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, I have a 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes may be long for a uh, NACO reviewer group because I've already um, shared uh, my um, uh, this issue via email. But for others, it may be a little interesting because it's a new topic. Um, but I am not an expert on the technicality of Unicode at all. I'm just going to talk about the practical things, what's involved and how to actually do it. Um, <clears throat> so I got involved in this issue while I was doing the authority reference cleanup project. I came up with several questions and started to talk with the colleague. And I ended up submitting two proposals to LC and PCC. Um, I shared my two proposals via um, seal East Leaf in, in January. This is one of them. Okay, so I'm gonna start topic now. Next, please. Uh, my topic today is, uh, no, Mieko, this is, please, uh, slide two, please. <laughs> this is three. No, this is two, two. Yeah, okay. So my topic today is how to record um, non-mark eight characters in authority record using a hexadecimal numeric character reference. Uh, in terms of creating or updating BIM record in OCLC, you can input any character that's available in the Unicode set. If you set up character set to UTF-8 Unicode in the co connection client, OCLC saves the record without any problem. But when we work on authority record, we are still limited to characters in Mark 8 repertory only. So if we input non-Mark 8 characters, system indicates it's invalid character. In this case, we, in the past, we used uh, several ways to indicate the character. With this proposal, we're going to use a new method called numeric character reference 
we can call NCR or NCR notation. Um, <clears throat> so CJK NACO best practice number nine is for this issue. Um, the content will be replaced with a new method, but I'm not sure of the web address. If a Paul put it in a new address, I will let you know. Next, please. Okay, here are the methods we used in the past. We used the getter symbol. At least the getter symbol can be used as a marker to pull record later on to convert it to the exact character when everyone agrees to accept all Unicode characters. The second method was putting Romanized reading in the bracket as you see. Um, this is not helpful at all. I don't know how to even pull record with this method. The last one was to put the bracketed reading in 4XX and provide the Unicode information in 670 field. This method at least provided the Unicode information for use in the future, but still need manual touch. The point is all the methods we use in the past will require manual conversion. That means we have to touch the same record again for the same reason by doing another project that will be a wasting of our time. Next, please. <clears throat> now the new uh, best practice is to use NCR notation, which makes an automatic conversion possible in the future with some programming. No human intervention will be required. We don't want to touch the same record again, just to convert those getta bracketed reading to correct character once we created or reviewed a record. So in short, the difference between traditional method and the NCR is, the traditional method is, it, uh, it uh, requires human uh, intervention, but with the NCR, machine will use NCR and convert automatically. Now, um, this method is not a new though, this method was available for a long time and recommended in Mark 21 standard from 2007. So some libraries in other language communities obviously use it intermittently, but for some reason, CJK community never used it and other language communities also stopped using it. So I proposed it to get an LCPCC's approval of using NCR in CJK language record. Actually, this method is workable for every language and everywhere in the MARC record, both BIV and authority record, except in the authorized access point in the authority record, which is 1xx field. Authorized heading should be only Latin. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually um, answering Hideki Sensei's uh, question when we had an email exchange with NACO review group. I didn't have a chance to answer until now. Um, the NCR notation can be used for not only personal name, but also everything else, like corporate body, series, uniform title, etc. Et Next, please. So here's the article in Mark 21 standard. Uh, I'm not going to read all due to time limit. You can read yourself and explore more the technicality of the Unicode. Um, it says NCR is a lossless technique. And the um, next page, please. next slide. Uh, there is a format. Uh, I'll talk about the format in the next slide. Next, please. <clears throat> now, the uh, most important thing is we have to use the exact NCR format that is required. This is the NCR format, uh, eight digit or sometimes nine digit, depending on the hexadecimal numbers. It begins with ampersand and ends with a semicolon. After ampersand, hash mark, lowercase x, and you put the hexadecimal value of the character. And lastly, end with a semicolon. The, this is, uh, the, at the bottom, there's a real uh, NCR example for character hyun in Korean name. Uh, UA76 is hexadecimal value. That value is surrounded by uh, ampersand, hash mark, lowercase x, and semicolon. Next, please. 
then how to find the hexadecimal Unicode value for a character to make the NCR notation? There are several ways or places you can search and get the Unicode value, such as Unihan database, Unicode list, etc. But those sites only provide the hexadecimal value itself, like uh, UA76 in the case of a character Hyun. So making up the full notation accurately requires accuracy. The full notation should be accurately recorded beginning with the ampersand and ending with the semicolon. I can already imagine that I would make a lot of mistakes, but fortunately, there's a perfect tool available called GitHub Converter. GitHub Converter will provide a complete NCR notation. The website is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, you, you, you can make a bookmark for this and use it. Next, please. Now I'm going to show you a few example record and talk about workflows. I'll talk about um, two cases, one creating record, two reviewing record. <clears throat> In every case, same basic principle applies. Find the exact character using whatever source you can and search GitHub. Copy and paste the full notation at the right position in the authority record. So first, creating a record, you have an item in hand. Um, this is an important factor. In the past, if the system gives an invalid character message, we would first go to the CJK compatibility database, which resided in LC site, and search to see if there is an alternative. But we can skip the process. Instead, I would say search GitHub Converter and use the exact NCR. Uh, here's a workflow. The character here is available from Korean IME, but it's invalid character. So copy the character, go to GitHub, paste the character in the first box, click the convert button right on top. You see the result in the fourth box under hex NCR. The converter provides full notation. You can simply copy the full NCR and paste it in the authority record. Next slide. Okay, this is the after screen. When you paste it, be accurate on the position. Remove unnecessary space or provide one if necessary. Korean last name follows a space. Hyun is the first character of the full name, so put NCR after a space. But make sure there's a no space before the second character. Uh, Chinese and Japanese last name do not follow a space. More examples will be available in the best practices and the following slides. Next, please. Now, <clears throat> reviewing a uh, record case is a little different. There's one more step involved. Uh, we need to check variant forms. But the principle is the same. Often there are several poor access fields with the different forms of Chinese characters in the record. Uh, in, the, in that case, we need to verify whether those are variant forms or totally irrelevant characters. If irrelevant, delete it. If variant forms, we keep them. Do your best for searching for variant forms using OCRC, or relevant dictionaries, union database, internet, etc. Uh, if you find the correct character, copy that and search it at the GitHub. Copy the full notation and paste it in the authority record. Uh, here, Chinese character um, Zhang is invalid character, but luckily one OCRC record has the character and GitHub provides the uh, full notation. So just to use it. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, this Japanese record is a little tricky. The first character of the last name Juru is invalid. Catalog provided the Unicode information of Juru in 670. 
I wanted to use this method as an example. So I searched OCLC for character. The character in the OCLC record was not the character for uh, 974F. Correct Unicode value for the missing character would have been 974E. So Hathi Trust the database shows the title page and that also shows character which is the same as the one in the OCLC record. Um, so I copied the character in OCLC and search this up. It gives a 974E notation. So I copy it, and paste the full NCR notation in 4670s. Now delete the bracketed Unicode information in 670. We delete this information because it's wrong and also it's a method in the past. Next slide, please. Um, there's a, one more thing we need to do in this record case. We need to check variant forms. Um, Hideki Sensei verified that these two characters are variant forms according to the CJKV English dictionary. Checking variant forms is an important task when we review records because if variant, we keep them in the record. The reason why we keep variant forms is because variant forms are interchangeably used in CJK countries. And during the life of an authority record, subsequent catalogers might have added the variant forms based on translated work or different manifestations, etc. Uh, here's the entry under the character for crane. Uh, there are five different characters at the lower part of the slide. Uh, all five seems to be variant forms according to this dictionary. So important thing is do not assume any character is wrong. There are some records that contain totally irrelevant character. In that case, delete the wrong form, but always check variant if you're not sure and keep them. Next slide, please. Okay, so since um, we verify the fact that both characters are variant, we keep both in 400. But you do not need to justify the variant form in 670. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, if you cannot determine what the exact character is, then use get a symbol. I mentioned before, Geta will be used to pull, pull record later, or if subsequent catalog come, comes, uh, comes across any um, resource for the missing character, then he or she can put the exact NCR at that time. Using Geta should be a last resort. To get a Geta, you can type 3013 and press Alt and X key in the authority connection. Next, please. Okay, this is uh, my last uh, um, slide. This is reminder. First, the whole point of using NCR is to record the exact character which appears in the item. We're not recording variant forms. Second, make sure to check variant forms by searching available sources thoroughly. If variant, keep them in the existing record. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Enjoy using NCR, thank you. Hello everyone, I am Jiang Xu, Chinese Technical Services Librarian of Yale University. I am going to provide you with an update on the major activities and progress of the project since May 2020. Next slide, please. What we accomplished in 2020. On phase one, Chinese and Japanese names, um, 8,538 RDA records for Chinese names were completed. 3,181 RDA records for Japanese names were completed. 
on phase one career names, the authority records are under three categories, Hangul RDA records, Hangul non-RDA records, and Korean RDA records. A total of 5,280 records for Korean names were completed. So by the end of August 2020, completed evaluation of phase one CJK records. Phase one began in September 2019. Um, by this opportunity, I wish to say thank you to all the project participants for your great contributions to evaluation of phase one CJK records. Next. Project Oversight Committee work in progress and next steps. CJK coordinators have prepared training part three, training on phase two and phase three that covers both phase two and phase three since uh, August, since August 2020. The coordinators have also drafted some new project Q and A's. The committee will finalize the phase two and phase three training documents, hopefully in spring 2021. The coordinators will then provide the training on phase two and phase three for the project participants. The committee will then move the project into phase two and phase three following the training. Next slide. Here is an outline of the draft training document on phase two and phase three. This training document is intended to provide general and specific instructions for project participants in evaluating phase two and phase three CJK records. Next slide, please. Here are the uh, phase two project assignments available at the project wiki site. Next, please. Here are the phase three project assignments also available at the project wiki site currently. Next slide, please. Next in 2021 for all the project participants, um, participate in the training on phase two and the phase three, the committee will invite volunteers to join phase two and phase three. Begin phase two, review CJK non-RDA records with one 670 field. Phase two will begin following the training. Uh, begin phase three, review CJK non-RDA records with multiple 670 fields. Phase three may also begin following the training. Uh, this is the end of my report. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the implementation team, um, Stella and Charlene are going to provide a brief progress up, update with every progress report with everyone. So welcome to SACO report. Uh, if you're new to SACO and don't really understand, the SACO means Subject Authority Cooperative Program. Next. Next slide. Yes. So we're going to provide a brief update and just try to cover some background and training webinar. Uh, we also envision next steps. And hopefully we have a little bit time for group discussion. Next slide. Some of you, if you participate in the CEO cataloging workshop in 2018, and there's a joint presentation given by Leah and Charlene, because we both serve on the subject analysis subcommittee, the subcommittee on facet vocabulary, and we use some CJK examples 
So it's a wonderful discussion in our workshop. So we reached the consensus we should have the CJK sickle funnel project to be um, to be done. So and because if we can join the CJK sickle funnel, that means we are able to submit proposal and adding the CJK term to the LC subject heading and genre term, demographic group term, etc. So also we think this is very important, you know, related to the link data development because this will support we are able to create control vocabulary, genre term, and always the URI identifiers. We also try to figure out a working model. We really think that it's very important for have the collaboration between subject specialists and the technical service librarian. Next slide. So in February 2019, so we call for volunteer and we have uh, five, you know, uh, implementation team members, Stella, Leah, Anja, Shi, and Shaolin. So we work together. And when we uh, reach to the point, really working on the training webinar and the application process, so we appoint two people as a co coordinator Stella and Shaolin. And, uh, and we were so lucky and we're so delighted to know um, Janice Young from LC accept our invitation. She's willing to provide training to us. So support SEAL to really establish this funnel group. So last summer is a beautiful summer. It's from July to August 7, 20 webinar was provided by, by, our, by Janice Young. And uh, we also received support from Veronica and Paul Frank. But it's amazing. It it really took us more than two years. It's really from planning to implementation. Next slide, Stella. Thank you. Um, for better connection, I'm gonna turn the video off. Uh, next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. Stella, I think she go back. Yeah, I said next slide a uh, little too fast. Uh, can we go back to slide six? Yes. So, um, this slide be after this one. Uh, so maybe I can finish the slide. Yeah. You take over for next. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about. It. Okay. That's okay. Sorry, I skipped the slide. And I really want you know let Stella take over soon. Anyway, so we have a lot of communication with Janice Young because Janice really want to design this training webinar really really helpful for SEAL community. So uh, she asked me about you know the size of participant and etc. Anyway. So she created a training model, really want to make it very interactive and focused. So she planned for a class of just between 12 to maybe 20, 20s, because she really want to include the exercise. She really want general discussion, make this training model very interactive. And uh, she did think this class is very technical. She really want to give all the training more, have more time to ask questions. And uh, she also have more time to really able to answer our questions well. And so we really think she make this training webinar is so interactive and focused. Stand up next. Okay, <laughs> sorry for the mix up. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, trainings and the arrangement. So as advised by the LC, the team send out email to the sale community to recruit participants. So um, one group, we have um, 16, in 16 librarians from 16 institutions as the core participants. They attended the training sessions, work on the exercises, um, participated actively in Q&A and discussion. 
And they were also the librarians who confirmed that they would submit CYCLE proposal to LC after the training. Another group consisted of 45 registered participants as the observer. They were not actively participated, but they uh, sat through the training and they were muted all the time. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. So um, seven training sessions um, were organized and arranged and focused mainly, uh, it's the slide before this one, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. So uh, the four main topic based on topical subject heading geographic subject heading, classification number, and how to use the proposal system. Next slide. We're showing you like um, some examples um, from our training slides. So to give you a little bit um, uh, idea of what we went through. Next slide. Um, this is one of the exercises uh, that we had and we basically, the core participants basically work on these exercises based on each session or each part of the training and we will work through it and then have the question and answer and discussion. Next slide. We actually had a very good feedback from both the trainer and also all the participants. The trainer liked our group so much because um, we participated very actively in the session and asked a lot of good questions. And she liked us so much and she let the core participants to interact directly with her instead of going through uh, a, a moderator. And she did mention towards the end that she really felt bad that the session uh, and the training was going to end. And she did mean it. She did mean it. And we felt it that way. And she said, and so soon. Next slide. And um, after the training, we confirmed that uh, 12 participants from 10 institutions expressed interest in joining the funnel. And the implementation team worked on submitting application to SACL in order to make it um, official. But then you all know uh, 2021, I mean, before 2021, a lot of things happened because of COVID-19 and um, it's kind of difficult to do a lot of things. So we had um, a team meeting and decided to postpone the application until 2021. And time flies, <laughs> now is 2021. So what is our next step? I'm gonna pass to Charlene to talk more about that. So uh, we are planning the next steps. As first, um, of course, we will try to submit our application. Hopefully, we can pick up our project soon. And so, if you inch, so we will try to finalize the uh, participant, and we will submit this officially. And in the meantime, we also look at the, some sort of it having the environmental scan. We really see more increasing demands of the DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusive terms. You can see a lot of webinars talking about this topic. Again, we do see that underrepresented populations or terms in the, is really missing in the LC subject headings. So also there's some existing terms. We really feel it's like language evolve over time. A certain terminology become really offensive now. And also we can see some collections, some terminology has been really, have terminology really is a euphemism, but now actually it's wrong because it's different kind of context. 
again, with linked data, you know, development, we think this control vocabulary. So we really welcome you to join this project. And also, hopefully, we can really have kick off the project soon. That's it. Thank you. Looks like the slides are ready. Yes. Go ahead, Shelly. OK. So I'm going to provide a very brief update on CJK Council Funnel Report. Next slide. So first, I want to say 2020 is really a challenging year also from Council Funnel. Um, in addition to some membership change because of job change, et cetera, um, so we do have a, some sort of, you know, on off. And also our Chinese reviewer, um, Kathy Wen, she has, she had to implement Elma and she's really busy. And also later on, she have another job change. So Shaolin become the, really the reviewer for Chinese record. And Steve Shadow still come in to review Japanese records. So I'm going to share a few of the review comments and also provide you a few concept updates and our future plans. Thanks. So I communicate with Steve Shadow and our you know, Japanese reviewer. And uh, as you know, COVID-19, because a lot of buildings shut down. So I spoke to several catalogs that they are just unable to access print serials. So that's why Steve have not received uh, much to review anyway. And uh, one thing I really want to emphasize is that she really praised our CJK catalog, the Japanese catalog is they doing a great job. And just very occasional correction, you know, or consideration is really minor uh, fix. And also, since I'm acting a reviewer for Chinese record, so I have I didn't really receive any print serial for review. So I only received one e-journal and one e-database for review. Next. So I want to provide you a few just council updates. If you monitor council listening, you may be aware. On the other hand, um, I don't know why, um, you know, Les Hawk retired last year, I believe in January 2020. And I know uh, he and Yuan, and she become the new council coordinator, but I haven't seen any official announcement, but we know we're talking to him for council questions. And uh, for example, last December, you probably received the message from him about LCCN the, um, for, for new LCC numbers. And because there's a major change, so LCCN won't be delivered a mail to your office anymore. It's not print label. It's become just you assign numbers on the spreadsheet. And the, the other really major update is, is really for CCM, the concert catalog in manual. Is under revision and it's been coordinated by our colleague Becky Copperson from UC San Diego. And she sent out the survey is they are, you know, after we implement RDA, the CCM still have some missing mar modules. It means there's no RDA instructions. So you can see the module number here, also appendix A to C. So I really want to cite the module 17, which is a really important one related works, including the instruction for reprints and never being updated for RDA. I also heard some feedback. For example, this concert documentation not being really consistent update, but we heard the announcement. For example, last year, LC implement 588 indicators. This is really in mark tagging already being announced. Um, however, just never been implemented for council yet. So LC make announcement and this being implemented last year. However, the council documentation still not being updated. So um, I communicated with him and she said she's going to communicate with Be Becky, could be a part of the CCM update. Again, you can see the margin number 13 there. Hopefully this will be updated soon. Next slide. And this is kind of an interim decision made by Les Hawken in May 2019. Hopefully this is not interim decision anymore. We can really see the real instruction on CCM. Next. So future plans. 
um, hopefully we able to see revised CCM soon, especially instruction for reprint series. So I heard from Japanese community, this is very important for Japanese serials for years. The other thing, um, I really think concert, the C CJT Council Fund, we should continue to collaborate with ERMB cooperative cataloging for e-resource project. And then you probably can hear more in the ERMB workshop um, at one o'clock. And uh, so the, they're going to upload the KPA file to OCLC Warshare Collection Manager. And some of you, they are the, if you are the Elma user, and that's another very important community is the Elma community. So you can upload this kind of info, this kind of KPA file. So we can make an e-resource metadata more shareable. As you can see, PCC concept record, they are really the open access metadata to share more globally and they can handle messy title changes. They can provide more detailed information in comparison to KBAR file. And most important is linked to the ISM International Portal. Next. That's all. Thank you. Um, so the next um, update will be the BIPCO update. Um, it's going to be by Leah Contursi, non-Roman script languages team leader at Princeton University. I'll, I'll turn it over to Leah. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, I will be very, very brief. Um, so this is a slide that lists the uh, institutions that um, have participated to the BIBCO funnel, the BIBCO CJK funnel. Uh, some of them, all of them, all the members uh, of these institutions have become independent. Um, and some in the past, one very recent, and it's the first one, and it's in red because it's really the newest uh, who joined. And despite the difficult year, obviously, uh, they have put some, um, invested some time to um, to go through the training for uh, PCC records. So um, many congratulations to the Getty Research Institute's library and in particular to Susan Cho, who started to contribute with Chinese uh, language records and she became independent uh, soon after that. The last two institutions listed here in blue, um, they are actually contributing in a different way in the sense that they are reviewers. So um, the new members who like, um, who wants to join. And uh, we also do not have a Korean reviewer and we will be eager to have a Korean reviewer. Um, so I'm just giving the uh, shout out uh, there. Um, these institutions have contributed in the past, but they're still contributing Though they do not uh, list their statistics uh, with the BIPCO CJK funnel, which is fine, it's just their prerogative. Any institution, institution has the prerogative to um, count the statistics, uh, either with um, you know, the overall uh, statistics of their own institution or with the BIPCO CJK funnel. Um, and if we go to the next slide, uh, thank you. Uh, we see that these are the statistics uh, for this year since March last year. So the new records contributed are only 37 and the changed ones are 34. But as I said, this is only, these numbers do not tell the whole story. Uh, the, the whole story is that those participants who joined at the very beginning, they're still contributing. It's just that they uh, count their statistics with their own institution. Um, and uh, I just want to add a couple more things. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, remember that last year uh, I uh, proposed to I actually um, proposed an inquiry. I asked uh, the community, our community, how they felt about uh, the detailed date of publication. If they, uh, if we wanted to create a best practices, a best practice for our, um, for our group, uh, and uh, I didn't receive uh, a lot of um, responses. 
but basically uh, the um, you know, the, the response, the, um, everybody unanimously said that we should probably leave this decision to um, the cataloger or to the agency and their preferences. As you know, uh, the RDA um, tells us there is an instruction in, uh, about the imprint that uh, we should uh, transcribe as is, as we see uh, the uh, uh, date of imprint. Um, but there's nothing really specific uh, regarding having the detailed um, imprint date in uh, um, in the manual for in the uh, BIPCO participants manual. So it's really up to the cataloger uh, and to the agency and their preferences. And since I asked this question and we came to this conclusion last year, I would like to take this opportunity to ask another question. And that takes me to my final slide. Thank you. Um, so this is, um, this is a, a, a question that I really um, ask to, especially to the Chinese uh, catalogers, to the Chinese language specialists. Um, so, um, as you all know, the Chinese publishing market publishes constantly humongous multi-volume sets uh, with the reprints, especially of old material, old titles, especially in uh, literature, philosophy, and history. So many libraries, like uh, my library, uh, requires that uh, for those titles that are in these multi-volume sets, the single titles, that we create an enhanced 505 field in our MARC records so that we give the possibility to our users to find those specific titles. And this is sometimes a very uh, big work that takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. So we came up recently with some ideas and uh, a way to economize in terms of time. Um, so what we do, either we ask the publisher the, the electronic format of the content, the entire content of the multi-volume set, or if we cannot find it or the publisher doesn't make it available, we scan the content usually uh, included in the first volume and we make it into a PDF or CR so that we can extract the data and manipulate the data. Recently, we have had some success in using Notepad++. And so um, globally uh, compose, it, compose that data into a manageable uh, 505 field. But my question to you all is that if if you, I would very much like to hear from uh, those of you who do this kind of work uh, and do provide the enhanced 505, this big 505 for the large multi-volume sets. Um, and I would very much like to have that conversation and to share notes because you may have a different way to tackle this issue. And so it would be nice to hear from you, compare notes and maybe learn from each other on how to, um, how to compose a 505, a large 505 in the best possible way, but in the least possible time. So if you have an interest, I will be very happy to start a conversation via Zoom with a group. And please email me, I would be very grateful if you do that. And so and that's all, and thank you very, very much. Thank you, Naomi and everybody. Um, well, hello to the old friends and the new ones whom we have not met. Um, I'm Jesselyn Zoom, as Naomi mentioned, um, currently chief of the Asian and Middle Eastern Division of Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access Directory at the Library of Congress. Um, together with my colleagues, Anne Roddy, China Section Head, and Yang Xin Li, Acting Northeast Asia Section Head, uh, we first would like to thank CTP for their invitation to us to provide this LC update. Um, we hope today's update will be an introduction for you to get to know our team and what we do, and hope this bridge will be extended to a closer collaboration between CTP and the LC Admin Division. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, first, about the scope and the responsibilities of our work. ASMIN acquires materials from Asia and the Middle East about topics of keen interest to the Congress and the American public using library appropriation fund and through formal exchange partners and also via gift donations. So we have a three means of acquiring materials uh, through purchasing, through formal exchange and through gift donation. Um, the materials include all formats with more and more electronic content. We also provide bibliographic metadata to the material. All of our librarians and technicians know at least one foreign language other than English. The division handles over 20 languages and many of those are in non-Latin script. Next, please. Much of this material goes to the African and Middle Eastern division and to the Asian division. This is our lovely Ahmed reading room. Next, please. Here's the Asian reading room with the classic staircases in the Thomas Jefferson building. Next, please. We lost 10 staff members in the past 14 months. The division has a total of 14 staff members currently. The division comprises four sections, China section, Israel and Judaica section, Middle East and South Asia section, and the Northeast Asia section. We also work closely with and provide support to four of the six libraries overseas offices located in Cairo, Islamabad, Jakarta, and New Delhi. Next, please. Here is a visual of where the material comes from. Next, please. I thought I would share with everyone a few highlights in physical 2020, a very traumatic and special year. Um, China section acquired COVID-19 related material from the epicenter in China during the early pandemic overcoming scaffolding challenges. NEA section is expanding e-content collecting through general approval plan in Korea and Japan. The Israel section launched web archiving pilot project to harvest Israeli government websites. We are working with an independent contractor to catalog Hebrew rare and non-rare material. The pandemic disrupted normal workflow, like many of you, as I have learned from this workshop, we also worked on metadata enhancement and a cleanup project, in addition to processing new receipts as best as we can. Next slide. Here are a couple of uh, database cleanup projects on undifferentiated name authority record containing non-Latin script and non-Latin script pre-mark enhancement. Next, please. Now, this and the next slides are to give you an idea of our acquisition and cataloging statistics in the recent years. Largely due to the pandemic, the expenditure and receipts dropped in FY20. The division acquired 47,000 items and obligated $1.4 million, the smallest of the past three years. Next, please. It is also interesting to note the, cha the changes in the different categories of productions. Um, you see here, green represents FY18, blue FY19, and yellow FY20. So looking at the chart, you see cataloging completion of new receipts and new name authority record creation dropped comparing to FY18 
and FY19. On the other hand, authority modification and big file maintenance numbers increased sharply because of the database maintenance projects as mentioned in the previous slide. Next, please. Uh, finally, a little bit on our current status of BibFrame testing for non-Latin scripts. The division BibFrame testers are continuing to create descriptions in the BibFrame editor supporting the development of BibFrame. Currently, the testers are inputting original scripts in the instance and romanization for access points in work. The library is planning to implement a BibFrame conversion to Voyager by the end of 2021. We do not yet know how this crosswalk will impact the non-Latin script cataloging workflow. The other known issue for years is that we can't update or input scripts outside of, outside of the Mark 8 character set in the ILS Voyager. We are exploring solutions in these two areas. That's all from me. And now over to my colleague, Yang Xin Li, Acting Northeast Asia Section Head. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will turn off videos to focusing on what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yang Xim Li. Uh, I'm currently working as an acting section head in the Northeast Asia section. Thank you for uh, your kind invitation to introduce our section and briefly update you on what the library have, has been doing during the pandemic. Although our section name is the Northeast Asia section, we mainly acquire materials published in Japan, Korea, and uh, on only small quantity of Korean language materials published in China. We have a four Japanese, six Korean, and one staff member who catalogs both Korean and Japanese, and she also catalogs both monographs and serials. Out of 11, a total of seven staff members have a full-time cataloging responsibility. Next, please. The boxes look very tired, but we are glad to see them too. Next, please. Our section acquires an average of between 22 and 25,000 items per year. I compared here the statistics, statistics of our total acquisitions between the years before and during the pandemic. You notice that there is no significant changes in purchase numbers but there are noticeable changes in non-purchase sources. Materials coming from our exchange partners and gifts from individuals and research institutions. As you can imagine, it is understandable that they, are in, they were impacted by the pandemic and they couldn't send the materials the way they used to send on a regular basis. Next, please. Or as all other libraries have experienced, we couldn't be any exception. Our library closed down and we were impacted by the slumped publishing industries, supply chains breaking down because borders are closed or surface mails were suspended. For me, the most difficult aspect of the problems we initially faced was the lack of technical support to telework immediately. Another issue was that we realized our workflow for acquiring materials had not been quite set up to work in a virtual environment. I have to admit that we have been following a very traditional hands-on process. As you can see from the previous statistics, all in all, we adapted to the circumstances with a great flexibility, relying on the dedication of our staff and our faithful vendors. Next, please. We could uh, adopt completely paperless workflow earlier than what we expected, thanks to the excellent support of the fiscal office and IT personnel. 
we could uh, implement over the whole acquiring and cataloging process from recommending titles by using online materials acquisition request service system to the entire acquisitions process, such as by creating centralized and limited access share folders for authorization process and the, to the completion of cataloging. Our file cabinets are quickly undergoing the same faith as our card cataloging cabinets. The areas that we had not quite yet ironed out are where will the repository be the original e-file copies? For example, are we going to keep license agreement files in a local shared folders or relocate to central location? It will all depend on the nature of the files. Another task we need to work on is establishing file name conventions. These are minor details, but the e-files need to be saved in a standardized name so that we can efficiently retrieve them when we need it. Next, please. Another area we have been working on, and uh, I am involved in some parts of it, is, is to establish workflow and documentation to acquire electronic resources, especially often available e-materials with the realization of the importance of digital contents in the virtual environment and the ever-increasing OA resources. I have to note that the workflow and task responsibilities for acquiring and cataloging digital contents are changing in our library. Like most library communities, all these years, electronic resources in our library have been handled by a special electronic coordinator with the operation being specialized and centralized because copyright and legal matters are involved. However, due to the sheer quantity of ever increasing digital contents, the library started to decentralize many of the tasks once performed by a specialist and distributed them to librarians like us who have been only processing tangible materials in the past. Next, please. Here are some examples of what a librarian will do. As a part of routine task of purchasing digital contents, we have to review a license agreement for the purchase electronic database and ebooks for our chief to sign. Sometimes an agreement has to be modified and the addendum to the license agreement has to be written after negotiation with a vendor or provider. Open access materials might not cost us anything, but it does not mean there is no restrictions to use or access. Even for routine ebook donations, we have to get copyright permissions from donors. Our library designed the copyright information and the permission form to get copyright permission from ebook donors in a streamlined manner. And the workflow has been established to collect openly available serials for all over the world. We nominate OA serials serial titles in the program called this vote, which will generate a notice or, or, or and the permission letters for the website owners for crawling, uh, before crawling targeted websites by our web archiving team. The harvest materials will be saved in the servers and they will be accessible from what we call Stacks 3.0 after embargo period is over. As a librarians, we are not accustomed to legal language or to describe copyright terms and conditions in the bibliographic records in the standardized language. Some catalogers have started to add 506 or 540 fields or add a summarized note about terms and use in ERMS. Right now, only a few step members from each divisions are handling these types of materials but the tests are shifting slowly but surely. A famous writer once said, the future is already here. It's just not entirely distributed. Now, please allow me to introduce Anne Roddy, the head of the China section. Thank you very much, Young Shim. And um, thank you, Jessalyn, as well as all SEAL members for inviting our uh, panel. 
today. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think my video is on, um, but I just see Young Shim's video. Uh, yes, and I can see you and hear you clearly. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, so where was I? Yeah, thank you for inviting us. And I remember actually last year, SEAL was the premier uh, COVID era virtual conference when all of us were just beginning to uh, glean the features of our shared pandemic future. Uh, I'm Ann Roddy, recently appointed China section head, Asian and Middle Eastern division. And I have many people to thank here as uh, colleagues and friends for uh, helping prepare me for this position. The China section has been operating in a big transition for a couple of years now following the retirement of Beatrice Ota, who had been a China section head for over half a century. And her retirement was preceded by several uh, librarians and uh, four more librarians have uh, retired uh, since I arrived, but we maintain a very strong small core and a tremendous amount of uh, institutional uh, knowledge right now. And Jesslyn has been a very persistent advocate uh, for the need for new staff. And last year, the China section was approved for two new uh, full-time positions. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our work. Uh, basically, we acquire material by purchase and gifts. And the, the works are composed in classical and modern Chinese, traditional and simplified characters, original translated bilingual editions from Tibetan, Mongolian, Manchurian, Uyghur, and Western languages. Um, the China section acquires, processes, and catalogs uh, materials from China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Inner Mongolia and Macau and maintains a, a very steadfast relationships with our vendors that have helped us tremendously to keep a steady flow of acquisitions throughout this period. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so reflecting on becoming a new supervisor during the pandemic, yeah, being from the Midwest, um, I say this is like um, being on thin ice. There are very, very few staff on site. Uh, cataloging models changed from on site uh, work in hand to teleworking with surrogates, uh, basically a transition from analog to digital workflow, and um, having to observe strict uh, fiscal deadlines. Uh, what I have to share about uh, this experience is to a certain extent um, challenges shared by all of us, but the sheer scale of the LC operations and the monumentality of acquisitions and bibliographic access tasks were uh, staggering both mentally and physically. Uh, there were very few staff on site at any given time, uh, catalog tech cataloging models in place for uh, decades had changed from on-site desk work, items in hand to teleworking with uh, laptops and, and surrogates. I mean, this may not seem like an enormous transition if you're in a university library, but uh, most of the China section staff had uh, never worked from home and had to learn an entirely new uh, digital workflow. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, during the early phased um, restoration, when people gradually began to come on campus again, uh, phase one, part two reopening, which be began in June, there were maybe 10% of um, essential staff on site. And I was quite anxious to be back in the library and uh, like a few others pitched in with all sorts of tasks like um, sorting the mail and ensuring that shipments were delivered to the appropriate sections in our division. Uh, several staff, stare, uh, excuse me, several sh staff shared tasks normally assigned to technicians or uh, the Office of Fiscal and Overseas Shipments, which uh, we're looking at here in this slide, including unpacking books, targeting, stamping, and shelving for cataloging protocol. Um, thousands of boxes um, of books that had been kept in quarantine arrived in a, a constant cascading flow 
uh, throughout the summer months. I mean, this is a slow day in the mail room and usually you couldn't see the other end um, of the room. But nonetheless, 97% of the approval plan allocations with vendors in mainland China, Taiwan, um, and Hong Kong were fulfilled during this uh, disruptive pandemic period that defined 2020. Um, next slide, please. So um, the through the librarian in residence program, uh, each year participants receive on the job training and undertake assignments that uh, contribute to the ongoing mission and work of the library. And uh, this year, the China section was very fortunate uh, to have Mr. Brian Chung from the University of Hawaii join us for uh, what we uh, call the hybrid uh, training, residency, in cataloging, and acquisitions. Uh, Mr. Chung has a broad language base. He's a native uh, Chinese, Mandarin, and uh, Cantonese speaker, and reading knowledge of Tibetan, Mongolian, and Manchu text. He's been an immense help in uh, both acquisitions and uh, cataloging of these uh, materials. Next slide, please. So, um, during his uh, MLIS program, he also contributed to a very rich uh, geographical research guide entitled uh, Geographical Research in China that um, is available to uh, view at this URL. Uh, next, please. So in addition to the librarian and residents hands on training, uh, we began to explore how to utilize strengths and place them in a fertile context to grow and support areas of interest and need throughout the library. In this case, we're using the LIR's background and work experience to develop and expand the use of databases brought to us through the Asian Division recommending officers, uh, including the acquisition of Chinamax, um, a new database of uh, containing over 750,000 titles. Um, the China section in collaboration with the Asian Division is working to make vast uh, collections of Asian digital materials from all uh, genres and periods available to the public. And this, of course, is in tandem with the um, Library of Congress mission statement uh, to engage, inspire, and inform Congress and the American people with a universal and enduring source of knowledge and uh, creativity. Uh, next, please. So um, in addition to the normal acquisitions on the cusp of the pandemic in February uh, 2020, the Lee family uh, presented the Library of Congress with a rare book, uh, rare as you can see, both in uniqueness of content and material formatting, the Lee clan genealogy, the Lee Shi Shipu, dated 1949. The 24 volumes, uh, one of two extant sets, are uh, divided in wooden encasements and contain records um, including uh, family lineage, biographies, funerary epitaphs, estate inscriptions, regulations and covenants, and essays and writings of the uh, Lee family members. This um, genre of genealogy is one of the oldest forms of Chinese historical record keeping and is traceable uh, to the Shang dynasty and the foundational years of the PRC and the uh, Cultural Revolution, most of these genealogies were burnt, but the strong uh, filial duty and diligence of the Lee family ensured that their family records survived and delivered the musty, gnawed uh, wooden boxes to the Library of Congress uh, Asian division intact. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is the front piece. Um, from the genealogy. Uh, next. So um, the painstaking cataloging was completed by Kathy Yang, our senior librarian of the ASME China section on November 24th, uh, just shortly before her retirement in late um, 2020. And the genealogy now resides in the Asian divisions, a rare book collection. Uh, next, please. 
So as for the future projects and um, rebuilding the section, um, that will certainly be done by integrating uh, the current institutional knowledge and staff and um, the um, and gaining uh, two new staff members. And then we're also engaged in a, a project recently, a media and crowdsourcing web archive, Crimes Against Asian Americans which will be a collaborative uh, effort between the China section of ASME, uh, Researcher and Reference Services Division and the Asian Division. And uh, we hope uh, to enjoin uh, many of you to contribute to this. Thank you very much.